This project is all about trying to understand the archaeology of a very important royal centre that was located at Liminge in the Anglo-Saxon period. And we're doing that through open area excavation on a large scale within the core of the village. The key discovery is that of a previously unattested royal complex that lies literally inches below the surface of Tain Field. This is the first example of one of these sites that we've excavated systematically within the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Kent. This is the very first time that we've been able to put the archaeology of a known Anglo-Saxon monastic community in its longer term context to see how it impacted a pre-existing royal centre and transformed the lives of the people that lived here. standing on the site of Canon Jenkins' investigations. Um, he was the vicar of the church in the 1850s. He was very knowledgeable of the historical origins of a monastic community here at Liminge, and that led him to try and recover the church, or the core building, at the heart of the monastic community. And literally inches below our feet, we have the foundations for a seventh century church that he revealed back in the Victorian period. So this wall here with the gravestones in it is actually constructed around the Eastern Apse. Um, now everything's been backfilled and, and, and you can't see anything at all. This year has produced the largest of a whole suite of major timber halls that formed our seventh century royal complex. It's on a massive scale, over 10 metres wide, 20 metres long, with really major structural elements to it. We've also found some really fascinating, slightly earlier Anglo-Saxon archaeology that appears to be focused on a prehistoric monument, a Bronze Age barrow. We have further buildings dating to the 6th century and this remarkable midden deposit that's filling a hollow that's produced a wealth of 6th uh, century artefacts. So what we're looking at here is a really large area um, of, of rubbish, essentially it's a rubbish tip, um, or a midden, we could call it in archaeological terms. Within this uh, midden area, we're getting quite a lot of really interesting objects which may relate to activity on the site um, and perhaps will help explain why we have this sunken area at all because these areas are very unusual. But we've got some really interesting clues. Um, for example, this sort of thing which looks incredibly unattractive. Um, it's not a pretty uh, artefact, a brooch or a piece of glass or anything. It's actually a piece of a, um, smelting slag. So they've been smelting iron um, and it's attached to this orange clay. This has been fired so it's been very very hot. So we're actually looking at the, the half of the furnace that which would have made which have been part of the smelting process here. So perhaps um, some kind of metalworking going on in this site. Right so in front of me I've got a selection of the many fragments of vessel glass that have been produced by the excavations this year. One of the commonest vessel types that we've got um, are what's known as cone beakers. We've actually got the entire base of one of these um, cone beakers from our excavations this season. Vessels such as these cone beakers have been found previously in Anglo-Saxon graves, cemeteries um, of this period, and very occasionally they come up whole. This is a, a modern replica of one of these cone beakers. Um, but what we're finding are the smashed remains of these vessels that are broken in daily use. But what it's telling us uniquely is the wide range of vessels that were being used um, as part of feasting events here at our high status um, settlement complex at Liminge in the, in the 5th and 6th centuries. and Humanities Research Council funding has allowed us to excavate on a large scale, a scale necessary to uncover what is very delicate 
um, archaeology. So for example, we employ professional archaeologists from the local commercial unit, the Canterbury Archaeological Trust. We have two members of their field staff that work with us throughout the excavation season. We also employ their education officer to help with the local outreach that we do to local schools. We are also partnering with a major voluntary organisation in Kent, the Kent Archaeological Society. Um, we use some of their facilities. For example, our travelling exhibition is currently in their museum in Maidstone. We wouldn't have been able to do any of that um, without the funding provided by um, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. various ways that we engage with the local community. One of the most important is that we hold inductions twice weekly for any, anybody and everybody basically. So without any previous archaeological experience, as long as people attend that two hour induction, they can then participate directly in the excavations themselves and help us dig the, this really important Anglo-Saxon archaeology. The other way is that we um, involve members of the local community in artifact processing and a core team has been with us on a daily basis and made a massive contribution to what is a really essential part of the process of excavation. We also hold a major open day once during the season towards the latter stages um, with lots of activities for children. We also have Anglo-Saxon reenactors doing crafts, for example, to help bring the archaeology to life. I do foresight tours over the day, and it's proved hugely successful. We had about 500 visitors last year, and we're hoping to get the same this season. But it's also very much about training the next generation of archaeologists. Um, we have several students from the universities of Reading and Kent, but also other um, UK archaeology departments, for example, UCL and York. We're actually training up archaeologists, the next generation, on this really important Anglo-Saxon archaeology. Music